thanks for uh, doing this with me. The, I guess the first thing is, you know, our folks uh, are, uh, most of them are sheltering, sheltering in place, kind of stay at home, work safe is what they call it. And we've got Houston and Austin and some of the smaller towns like Waco and Tyler beginning to do that and uh, others. And, and I think that um, my perception is, as you said, that, that some people are doing well, some people are struggling. We've got a lot of people trying to work and homeschool and uh, in the midst of all of that, the, um, uh, the, the, fact that the church has gone online or gone virtual is is good in some ways and a struggle for others i think a lot of people did well on palm sunday which was just this past sunday yeah. uh, but uh, uh you know i think uh, it's good to know that uh that we're not the only ones too so how, what's it like there yeah i mean i think it's the same i i think that um you know, uh, the vast majority of folks I know really cherish uh, the uh, worshiping in person, um, you know, being physically gathered around that table. Um, but I think also people realize that, um, you know, our spirituality, our tradition uh, lends itself to adaptation. I mean, and, and so, um, you know, in theory, nobody likes to have that conversation, but in reality, uh, I think people are rediscovering that we have riches in our prayer book that can sustain us. I've tried to talk about that with folks. I've tried to uh, remind people of that. I've tried to commend that to people. Um, we have a lot of people who are really leaning into this, I think, and are excited about this. And we have other people who are a little bit more reluctant for very good reasons. So, you know, it's, it's just trying to... Um, it's trying to offer what we have to offer in earnest and inviting everybody to share the responsibility of this difficult time. And so I've, I've especially asked the clergy to, to really not to overfunction as difficult as it is to let your sort of anxieties run wild, but to, to really commend the riches of the prayer book. I mean, that's, that's where I've really sort of spent a lot of time on and letting people take up, uh, you know, all the things we say in baptism that people, that people will really sort of own. Uh, the faith themselves and, uh, and, you know, convene, you know, the daily offices or compliment at least, or, you know, probably not a, uh, the same things that you're doing. And, and uh, I think once people are getting over sort of the immediate shock and now settling into some of the loss of, of Sunday, especially heightened because of Holy Week, um, I'm hearing more clergy and more lay people that I'm coming into contact with uh, rediscovering um, uh, you know, those daily liturgies. Yeah. You know, we, one of the ways we got into this conversation is talking about how, uh, uh, we are learning some behaviors that may actually be good for us. Yeah. I, I don't think anybody would choose for us to remain worshiping by ourselves in our homes. That's not yeah. what I'm saying, but that, you know, in some ways, uh, Bob Johansson says we can see, uh, the future kind of floating back to us and flotsam and jetsam or, um, and certainly you can see some courage and vulnerability and all of that uh, as well. Uh, what are some of the things that you see that we might be learning uh, now that, that, you know, when this is uh, comes to our new normal or a different normal, we may need to use and fall back on for mission, for ministry. What are the things you think people ought to be paying attention to? A couple of things. Uh, one, one of the things that I, I've, I've gotten a, a, a great sort of confirmation of is that we've been talking about in the Diocese of Atlanta and, and no doubt in the Diocese of Texas and other places, this notion about innovation and adaptation. We've been talking about that. I've been singing that song every day of the week and twice on Sundays, right? As the Spirit's activity in, in us and through us in leadership to prepare us for the future that God is calling us into. And um, I think we are experiencing a little bit of the benefit of having had that conversation prior to this. And so um, I, I think that as we sort of evaluate across our, our diocese, um, uh, people are at various speeds, but nevertheless sort of embracing this notion that we're just going to have to adapt. We've talked about the church is not closed, the church is adapting. And the truth of the matter is, is that when we look back over the church's history, uh, we have responded to, to many things uh, very well, by and large. We have not initiated lots of things, but we have responded. We have found um, that our faith has served us well in response to things that the world has thrown at us. And so we're finding that. 
I think one of the things we're learning is, is and, and I'll, I'll tell you a story about a little congregation. A little congregation in North Georgia uh, was, was motoring along wonderfully well, 100 and some odd souls, just, you know, just doing the, the meat and potatoes of the work. Good priest, great lay people. And, uh, and uh, not somebody on my radar who I thought was going to sort of really lean into adaptation, innovation. But out of uh, an abiding sense of pastoral care, realize that there's an opportunity here. Now uh, their attendance has tripled online. And uh, they are incorporating members as far away as in India. Uh, on the, on the, the uh, sermon that I got to preach in, in, uh, to them uh, via online, uh, a, young, a youngster in that congregation who was 16 or so read one lesson and a dying woman who was 99 uh, uh, was recorded to read uh, one of the other lessons. And there we were, nevertheless, together. And the woman uh, sent a message to the priest saying, finally, though I've been getting visited, I'm finally in worship now. And so I, I think, where do you go from there? You don't, you don't close that door once this is over, right? And so I, I think what we are learning is, is that um, proclamation, we, we, we perhaps have been limiting proclamation perhaps not been thinking as broadly about proclamation as we have needed to. Uh, I think we've also uh, learned that we've actually got something to say. Our, we've got a robust faith that we can commend. And so we've got to think about the delivery systems. Um, and so that, that part of it is very exciting for me. Uh, some people are, are getting into this competition about, you know, sort of in person and online. And, you know, my answer is yes. You know, my answer is, is that, you know, we've got a good God and a good gospel to come in. How, how about let's do all of that? So I think that's, that's number one. I think the other thing we've learned is that, um, you know, uh, we've had the luxury of debate about change in the church for, for, for a while now. And, that, and, and Corona has come and taken that luxury away from us right now. And, uh, and so a number of congregations are really having to figure out what do we do and what, has, what is essential? What is essential uh, to this enterprise? And I, I think those are hard conversations. We've had the luxury of sort of dithering about them and we don't now. And so, um, you know, yeah, those are just a couple of things that come to mind. And, and I have to tell you, I'm excited about that because I, I under, my understanding of Anglicanism is sort of outlined at the very beginning of the Book of Common Prayer, which is we hold on to a tradition, yes, uh, but we also account for the exigencies of time. And that's what makes Anglicanism, I think, a living, breathing thing, rather than just a, a sort of beautiful museum piece. Right. Uh, and we're being forced into that. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think it's very similar in our di listening to clergy talk about um, how powerful it is to have people engaging with them during worship and a couple of different ways in which they're doing that online. And, um, you know, the, the fact that people are looking at it far more than just their parishioners. So they know they're, they're, uh, receiving views, if you will, or participation, uh, from, uh, far and wide. And, you know, in a, in a time when people would love to see what you do before they go experience it so they know what they're getting into, uh, yeah. video, to, uh, you know, recording the service or putting the service up live, all those kinds of things are very real ways people can participate. And then I think, too, the, that witness of uh, uh, all of our shut-ins uh, who, who, you know, my mom before she died. She last three or four years. She had her own iPod, uh, iPad, and she could like navigate that thing. And you know, I just think about. She loved having people come visit, but if she'd been able to go to church on Sunday, she would have gone uh, through uh, her iPad because she couldn't physically make it to church. And those kinds of things that really uh, uh, offer a pastoral option for what we're doing, right. so not just an evangelism option, but realize some of our people can't come. And how do we uh, offer that? I think those are uh, the other thing, the other piece of fascinating, just a little story about a, a person who runs a, uh, is running a Bible study, live Bible study on Zoom. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, on Facebook, uh, the live Bible study on Facebook. And they, uh, they had over 200 people watching 
Uh, and he said, you know, I'm lucky to get five people <laughs> in, <laughs> in the vestry uh, right. uh, with the Bible on Wednesday. Right. I'm like, and I said, well, yeah, of course. But, you know, I didn't have to put on clothes to go to that. I didn't have to put my shoes on, get my kids taken care of, feed everybody. You know, I yep. could actually get everything done that evening, send the kids off to do homework and join you yep. for Bible study. And so you begin to realize our ministry itself, our actual proclamation of word beyond just service, the yeah. service uh, or uh, prayer services can, can really tap in. So, you know, well, before we started uh, to record this, we were talking a little bit about leadership. You know, not everybody likes this. Some people it's really hard for them. I'm curious, just because you you uh, have a, a good sense about leadership, um, you know, when I when I get the criticism, I'm I'm going to spend a few minutes, like I got a noodle on it a little bit because it it hits me pretty hard, and then I've got to go to my second, third, or fourth thought yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get beyond what that does personally. Uh, what do you do with the criticism that when it comes and how do you kind of internally, how do you parse that out? And then what's your goal and how you kind of come out publicly with that? Because our clergy are doing that and in large part on our behalf, right? Because we're the ones who said you have to do this. Right. Have, like, you know. Right. No, I, I think that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have any better s skills uh, than, than you do in this uh, uh, to commend. I think that, um, uh, like you, uh, it stings when it comes, um, especially because what you're attempting to offer in terms of leadership activity is, uh, is you're trying to account for uh, the pastoral piece. You're trying to take care of people uh, and you're trying to do what is, what, is, what is good for the system ultimately, right? And so it always stings when you get the criticism. But I, I think the first thing you got to do is you got to do, you have to noodle on it. I think you, you, we have to have the capacity to hear the most unflattering interpretation of ourselves and of our work. I, I, so I think you gotta build up some muscles there. Right. And you gotta be able to stand there. Now people don't get to sort of trash you personally, right? I, I think you sort, of, you, you sort of throw that out, but I think you, 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 you stand uh, and face up to, you know, I think uh, the criticism that is even unflattering about you because there's, there's oftentimes something to learn there, I have found. In fact, the truth of the matter is, if, if I'm anything, uh, especially in my work in the church, I'm the product of some people who, who didn't buy everything I was selling, who brought a heavy dose of constructive criticism and, and maybe even some, some cynicism uh, to some of the things I've said or tried to do. They have helped me. They have prepared me. So that's number one. I think number two is, is that you, you got you to gotta engage in some, um, uh, some self-management. I think when, when we're noodling in the face of criticism, we can default to some, some old narratives in our head that come from home or come from other places. And if we're not careful, that stuff, uh, we give that stuff permission in the face of criticism, and then we end up going out and doing things that we otherwise would not do that are against our better judgment. Uh, and so I, I think you, you got to sort of uh, take a look at yourself. you got to hear from yourself. you got to pause a minute. And realize, okay, what what is this narrative? Um, am I am I bringing back some old words about my worthiness or about my anxiety or whatever it is? And then I think the last movement you got to do is you got to figure out: uh, Do I refine or do I hold steady? Yeah. Do I refine? Do I pivot? Do I admit a misstep? Uh, do I admit a blind spot or do I hold steady? And for that piece, I always engage others. That, that stuff is always done with others. And so you have a diverse team of, of people who think differently, but are ultimately aligned around purpose. And you say, hey, gotten some feedback about this or that or the other thing. Uh, let's put that back in, in the machine here and think about that again together. Um, sometimes that results in a refinement. Uh, sometimes it results in holding steady. So we've experienced that right now in terms of moving worship online. Right now, a lot of people are getting criticism because they think that in, somehow, in, in some way, it's somehow politically partisan to move worship online uh, and to sort of, uh, and to sort of uh, uh, not, you know, sort of maintain social distancing, et cetera, uh, as it's sort of laid out. But as we have told people is, is that we're not afraid and we're also uh, not sort of being partisan in this regard. What we're trying to do is just... Uh, uh, Say hey, Rob. Uh, 
I account, account for an abundance of caution. And so political directives aren't our ceiling height, they're our, our, our floor height, right? Right. right? right, and so this is what we try to help people understand. But yeah, it's been difficult. And uh, I think the other thing too, we have to remember when we're facing up to that criticism is, is that it's ultimately not personal. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and, and people are dealing with their own stuff. I mean, it's, exactly. there's a whole other series of narratives we don't get, we don't get the privilege of seeing necessarily unless right. we have real, real relationships with folks. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, it, these are, these are hard lessons to learn, but I, but I, I think that this is the stuff that leadership is made up of. Yeah. So two last questions. One, uh, as you kind of look out into the future and we, uh, what would you like to see us kind of take with us there, not just kind of our learnings, but are there things maybe you don't see quite yet? You'd love to see us step into a little bit more uh, as we go. And then one last fun question after that. Yeah, I'd, li I'd love to see, um, um, in addition to sort of uh, doing the, the daily prayers that are online and all that sort of stuff that I've been very proud that we're offering, I I'd love to see people sort of pin this more to scripture as mm -hmm. well. I'd love to see people find some imaginative ways to sort of get, get those 66 books uh, you know, going with the people. I, I'd love to see us uh, use this as a real opportunity to, to dig into the deeper stuff uh, of the faith. Uh, so you know, what did Ezekiel do when he was in exile, when he was, you know, he was at the stay at home? What did Jeremiah do when they were at stay at home? Um, how have men and women, you know, in, in centuries past and millennia past held steady and found faith, you know, when the worship was, when the, when the temple was destroyed and people had to worship differently and pray differently, what did they do? So what can we call forward? So I always like to say that this is a neo-apostolic age, right? And so, and so maybe we go forward by going downward into those stories. Right. Um, so I'd like to see a little bit more, more of those. And I, I'd like to see some more young people, uh, you know, taking up some agency, helping us. I had a Bible study with about 45 kids the other day uh, who otherwise would have been uh, a confirmation class. And, uh, you know, they're asking all the right questions. How do you know? Um, you know, uh, what's a good life? Uh, why shouldn't we be afraid? I mean, they're asking all the good stuff. And I think they, they want to they wanna help us uh, remember the main things. Yeah. And so I, I want to give them the, uh, the microphone more often. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I certainly, my comfort, I think, in the last couple of weeks has been to, to remember some of those stories and ways in which Christians, uh, but the larger narrative, right? I mean, I think sometimes we get so focused on just Christian experience or even the New Testament experience, and we yeah. forget that God's been raising the dead and healing the sick for a very long time. For uh, a little while, that, yeah. Right, and that there's a whole arc of, of narrative about a God that uh, people have been invited into and to experience that kind of sustaining a uh, grace uh, from the yeah. very beginning. Uh, There's a whole lexicon. I, I think this is what's so important. I mean, in terms of a real useful, practical thing, there's a whole lexicon, 6,000 years of faith. Right. I was, I personally was blessed uh, the other week where we had to spend some time with Ezekiel and God in a valley. Yeah. And what really jumped off the page at me this time was that Ezekiel was not only a prophet, he was a priest. And so he's disoriented, dislocated, formerly, you know, spent a lot of time taking care of folks. And now, you know, he's in an open air cemetery, you know, and what did God have to say to him? Yeah. And so it's, it, yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a, there's a treasure for us there. There's some riches that we can pull forward into now. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think too, uh, you know, I think people, people are right now grieving. I, I really like that Kubler-Ross thing. It kind of helps me, but also I have to remember that there are people are at different points in their yeah. grieving and there's going to be more grieving. Like we're grieving being at home right now. We're be grieving being disconnected, grieving, missing the sacrament. But there's going to be uh, a transition out of this where we will grieve the dead that were lost. There's going to be grief over the fact that we as a culture will have been reshaped socially, uh, politically, financially by this, right? So there are other griefs of, ahead of us. Uh, and so being able to find those passages uh, and that lexicon, as you said, is really gonna be essential 
for the long-term work. And I think we will have to grief, uh, have grief about, we will experience grief about uh, the fact that uh, it won't be what it was on March 1st. No, that's exactly right. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that whenever we're sort of able to get back into sanctuaries, whatever that Sunday is going to be, it's going to be Easter, you know, <laughs> uh, experientially. But but we're going to have to do some funny stuff because I, I think that even though that, that may be an Easter Sunday, so to speak, when we get back together, um, there'll be some good Fridays that we'll have to recall yeah. and, and do that work. And I, and I think that now's an opportunity for, for us to think about ways in which we can do that. Uh, we can't just return to normal. We can't just say, oh, we just went through that and off we go. Yeah. Um, you know, grief leaves a residue. Loss leaves a residue. And, and it has to be addressed um, for people to really get to hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. And it'll come back. I mean, yeah. the, the, the mourning, the loss of family. We know this through the mourning loss of family members, don't we, or a friend, uh, in which the season comes back to us. We, right. Next Lent won't be like the previous Lent. Right, right. We will right. remember. And some of us, you know, as we look at an 18-month tale on this, some of us right. may be in isolation at that moment. And so, you know, that will itself play play some havoc on our desire to normalize yeah. uh, the past uh, and our um, uh, nostalgia. I, I, there was an old NPR, I'll say this, and we can go to the next question, uh, the last question. There's an old NPR thing. Oh, it was years and years ago, and they had a, a, a scientist on there who his, his work was, he was a psychologist, I imagine he his work was to study happiness. And, uh, he, and so they asked him, well, what makes uh, people uh, happy? And he said, a lack of nostalgia. He said that if you, can, if you can remove nostalgia, then you can remember the way it really was. And having, remembering the way it really was, to your point about the scripture even, uh, the, remembering the way it really was will help us remember uh, that there's always hope in the whatever reality we face. And if we have a little bit of hope, then we can be happy about where we are, uh, as opposed to measuring ourselves over and against a false reality of the past. Yeah, yeah I think that's very wise. I, I was struck by uh, the Queen's address the other day. Uh, in 68 years of, of reigning, mm -hmm. this was only her fourth address right and, and and it was interesting that she she threaded that needle uh, just as you have described it uh she remembered that we had been through very difficult times and i'm told that she even gave the address from the very place that she and her sister gave the address uh when when children were being sort of carted off and saved and spared because they thought that the fall of england was imminent yeah yeah and I, and I, I think there's a, a, a leadership lesson there. And, and, yeah. and so she was helping them remember the contours of, of difficulty mm -hmm. and nevertheless saying, and we will meet again. Yeah. And I, I think she, she threaded exactly that needle. Yeah, it was so, really good. Really so good. the past has not always been happy, but we have persevered. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now, last question. Yeah. I imagine that uh, uh, – Bishop Wright, in his uh, seclusion and his stay at home, <laughs> work safe, goes out, maybe tinkers a little bit uh, with a car, um, does a little exercise, uh, reads the scripture. But what people really want to know is what television show are you binging and what non biblical book are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I don't know about a non biblical book I'm reading just yet. I can tell you that my, my wife, uh, 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 found on Netflix this uh, this series called Unorthodox. Oh, and uh, it was yeah. fascinating about a woman who had been a member of an Orthodox Jewish community, and what it's been like for her to sort of leave that community and find her her own way. And it was I just we couldn't get enough of it. I yeah. mean, I, I mean my my sad my sadness was is that the thing was over. It was fantastic. It was well done. It was very thoughtful. Anyway. So that was just sort of, uh, that was delicious for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, rather than books, I can tell you, I'm a diehard 
sort of Frasier fan. Uh, and so I still, <laughs> and I think maybe some of the writers of Frasier were Episcopalians because every once in a while there's the odd Episcopalian reference there. Yeah. So uh, that, that's always a source of, uh, of non-biblical laughter and fun. That's excellent. That's excellent. Very good. Well, yeah. thanks a lot for this today. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. We look, we look to Texas for a lot. So thank you for always Great leading. Kidding. Thank so, you. Uh, what is it? Michael Curry always says, if I can steal from somebody, I will. Well, we steal from you and Jennifer <laughs> and all the rest. So, Vice versa. Uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm.